In month four, we're going to tackle carbohydrates. And I think if there's one group of foods that is the least well understood, uh, it would be carbs. And we tend to lump a ton of foods into this one single category. And because of the, the popularity of low carbohydrate diets, they're often all vilified. And what we're going to do um, in this month is really recognize which carbs or carbohydrate food, uh, uh, rich foods are going to be healthy and good options for you and which ones should we avoid. So our task for month four is to eliminate processed carbohydrates and instead eat lots of colorful starchy vegetables. And as you'll notice, there is a little bit of, of a gray area with some of these foods that we'll dig into um, a, little, a little bit deeper. Um, and, and sometimes I have a hard time with patients really giving them concrete advice and, and it, it may have to be a trial or error. There's some foods out there, specifically what we're about to label the bad category, um, where there's a lot of variability from person to person and it depends, it's going to depend on your age, your activity level, and the speed at which you're losing weight. But it also is a, an area where you can add some flexibility to your diet so that when you eat out with friends or family members who aren't following the same program as you, you'll have a little bit of wiggle room. So in my first book, I labeled, I broke down carbohydrates into what I called the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's um, dig a little bit deeper here on that. And first, let's discuss the good. Now, the good are colorful, starchy vegetables. These are beets, squash, sweet potatoes, turnips, and yams. And in general, these are, are really fantastic foods that you can eat liberally. They're very filling, they're delicious, and they're something that you can add to your diet um, without any concern for their weight gaining effects. In fact, I consider them thermostat lowering foods, and the more of them you eat, the thinner you will become. They're delicious roasted, and more, most importantly, they really satisfy some of our carb cravings. So if you're craving bread or pasta or rice, Colorful starchy vegetables sometimes can fill that void and allow you to, 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 to go without those more processed versions and still satisfy that kind of carb craving. Um, and also, I, I think a special note is spaghetti squash and butternut squash. They are absolutely fantastic. If you have not tried these, you are totally missing out. Spaghetti squash is incredibly easy to cook. And it really has an, a texture that is very similar to spaghetti. And with a little bit of marinara or in replacement for any other way that you would normally eat pasta, it makes a great choice. Now, butternut squash has a sweetness in it. It has some sugar in it. And it is absolutely delicious. We've got a recipe for butternut squash and pumpkin seeds um, that is so delicious and, and so satisfying and so filling. You can turn it into a meal or it can be a side dish as well. Um, so if you haven't tried these foods, they're really worth, worth experimenting with. Now, the bad group is a, a fairly diverse group of foods. And it, what it really includes are whole grains as well as colorless starchy vegetables. And this is where the gray area is. Um, so just quickly to go over them before we take a deeper dive, um, uh, Buckwheat, which is not something most people eat, but occasionally I'll get asked about it. That's a whole grain. Brown rice is a whole grain. Corn, although it does have color, it nutritionally behaves like a colorless starchy vegetable. A millet, another grain that every now and then will come up as a topic of discussion. Oats, popcorn, quinoa, white potatoes, and whole grain breads. So before we dig, uh, dig deep into discussing these foods, let's talk about the, the category at the other end of the spectrum, the ugly. And this typically comes as no surprise to people that white bread, white rice, and white pasta, heavily processed carbohydrates, are weight gaining thermostat raising foods that we have to work to eliminate from our diet if we want to lose some weight. One that often people don't think about is instant oatmeal. And it really is different than other oatmeal and has to be set aside in a separate category. So instant oats, first of all, they're almost always loaded with sugar. This, it's really become kind of the frosted flakes of the warm cereal. So this uh, Quaker honey and almonds has 10 grams of, of uh, added sugar in it, which is way more than you would eat and is comparable, again, to sugary cereals. And, and instant oats are different from quick oats which are different from rolled oats and steel cut. Steel cut oats, rolled oats, and quick oats are, are, are much more similar than they are different. But instant oats, so that you can literally just, you can, you know, it doesn't even need to be warm water. You can pour any water into instant oatmeal, 
and it'll turn into a mealy paste. Um, they're processed different. They're stripping out the fiber from them and really making them a very different product than the less processed oats. Another thing that's worth mentioning in terms of replacing pasta beyond the spaghetti squash we just talked about uh, are these bean-based pastas. And this is a shout out to a company in Detroit um, that is made from chickpea flour, so which is really ground chickpeas. Um, there's a few other ingredients, but the vast majority of this food is chickpea flour. This is really nutritionally is much more of a bean than it is a carbohydrate. And as we're going to talk about next month, beans are something we want to eat a lot of. So there's, this is not the only brand that's out there. There's a lot of other ones that, that you can eat that um, have that same consistency. You'll often find them in the gluten-free aisle, but don't confuse them with other, other gluten-free pastas. Most gluten-free pastas are made with a brown rice flour or a flour made from another uh, grain that doesn't contain gluten. These are very different. And the, again, there's other brands, but they, they're made from beans. And, and again, you figure this out by reading the ingredient labels, not the grams of carbs and grams of, pasta, uh, of, uh, and grams of fiber and other things like that. So now let's take a deeper discussion into um, the bad category. And there's really whole grains, and then I'm going to break wheat off from that because that, that is a separate discussion. And then finally, colorless starchy vegetables. So when we look at the thermostat raising and thermostat lowering potentials of these foods, what we find are that colorless starchy vegetables and whole grains kind of straddle the fence a little bit. And this is that gray area that I discussed. If you are um, a little bit older and um, perhaps a, a postmenopausal uh, woman, if you're inactive, then these foods may end up on the thermostat raising side. Uh, on the converse, if you're younger, if you're very active, and, and again, this, there's this kind of magic of how our body breaks these things down and, and processes them, this genetic component that's impossible to really know without doing a little bit of trial and error, um, then um, you'll be on this lower side. So, so these, are, these foods really, you know, they can go either way. They're not going to be super thermostat lowering, but they're also not going to be super thermostat raising. So in general, most people are going to find that they can incorporate them into their diet um, maybe not initially, but down the road as they get into this program and perhaps move from the weight loss phase to a more of a weight maintenance phase. So let's talk about whole grains. Millet, oats, brown rice, quinoa, rye, buckwheat, barley. These in general are foods that probably we should try our best to stay away from as much as possible, but a little bit here and there is acceptable. I'd say maybe up to one serving a day, again, depending on your activity level, depending on your genetics and past tolerance of these foods, um, depending on your age. Now, this is the food pyramid. This actually, the, there really isn't a food pyramid anymore. But I, I, I point to this often because it shows you how unreliable a lot of nutritional guidance that comes from the government has been. And when, this th when the uh, food pyramid first came out, in general, the, the bottom of the food pyramid, what we were supposed to eat the most of, were breads and grains. Now, at the time when they were developing this, they had a bunch of scientists in the room and um, they were all nutritional experts. And when they reviewed the science, they really couldn't support uh, heavy use of whole grains. So it got out to the, to, the in, to the grain industry, which at the time was really huge. I mean, the food industry is big now, but there's a lot of other players too. But you know, back 20, 30, 40 years ago, the food industry was such a dominant force. Uh, and they got, it got out that the government was about to suggest that perhaps we shouldn't eat as many whole grains as we are. And they went crazy because this was going to destroy their, their profits. Uh, they were growing businesses. They talked about how it was going to put farmers out of business and how important it was to preserve the, the grain industry. And after a lot of back and forth and some heated arguments, it, they came back completely ignoring the science and said that, that you've got to... Um, they put the grains down at the base of the food pyramid. So the industry got their way and the scientists were completely ignored. And this is not an uncommon event when it comes to um, uh, industry or government funded programs that the scientists often have the, 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 most, the quietest voices and are the, the most ignored because they don't have the economic um, impact uh, in terms of uh, in their best interest. And the economic impact always has to be considered from a government or an industry perspective. 
So now we have this myplate.gov, choosemyplate.gov, and it makes a couple of recommendations. It's a little more vague at this point, and, but it, what it says is make at least half of your grains whole. So they've kind of moved away from saying eat a lot of whole grains uh, or eat a lot of grains in bread, and instead they just say, well, you should try to eat whole grains if you're not eating. It's incredibly vague, and I can tell that this was a well-crafted statement that was made after hours and hours of compromise. Needless to say, whole grains are probably something that we should be avoiding. Um, and the, the, I wanna talk also about this, this whole grain stamp that's out there. And if you go walking through the grocery store, you may find some of these um, stamps on some of the foods that you're purchasing. And it's put out by a, this, um, uh, uh, whole, this council called the Whole Grains Council. And they, when you go to their website, they really present themselves as this incredibly conscious watchdog group that is out there to help you choose the healthiest foods so that you as an individual who wants to focus on your health has the ability to distinguish processed foods from unprocessed foods. Guess who funds the Whole Grain Council? And at least from a transparent perspective, they put it all on their website, but it's pretty much anybody who's anybody in the food industry. So every big food company supports money to the Whole Grain Council, and the standards to become a whole grain are so incredibly low. Here's a list of foods that have the whole grain stamp. Apple Jacks, chocolate Cheerios, big chewy peanut butter chocolate chip granola bars, cinnamon crunch cereal, Uncrustables, and the Max Breakfast, I've never seen this thing, but the name I couldn't get away from. The Max Breakfast Boat Turkey Sausage Eggs and Nacho Cheese Sauce. Somehow, this food got a stamp of approval as a healthy option. You, do not, you don't need to be a physician. You just need to have even a tiny bit of common sense to know that there's no way that this is a good food choice for you. But the whole grain stamp says it is. Another thing to be wary about is quinoa. Now, quinoa is a grain. Some people say it actually behaves a little bit more like a legume or a bean, and it does have a little more protein than most grains. And in its unprocessed state, it's actually a great food, and you can add it to salads, and it's certainly something that we should feel free to eat. Um, but it is also very easily processed. It's cheap to grow, and it has this reputation out there as being this really fantastically healthy food. And so this sets it up perfectly for the food industry to start to use it in its marketing campaign. So you're seeing these things like quinoa puffs from chocolate with lots of sugar in them. And they're processing the quinoa, they're stripping the fiber out of it, they're adding sugar and artificial flavors and doing the same thing they've done with yogurt, um, with granola, with a lot of other foods that had a reputation for being healthy but could be heavily processed, sweetened, and flavored, and sold with a large um, pr uh, profit. So be very wary of quinoa. There's the quinoa cereals. There's also the quinoa breakfast cereals, which are going to be real similar to those instant oats that we talked about earlier. So moving on past whole grains into wheat. So before I do that, I just want to make a comment that with, with um, the whole grains, like bread, I'm sorry, like oatmeal and brown rice, that there's going to be a little bit of room for those unprocessed um, foods in your diet. Um, I don't want to overly vilify them because I think when they're unprocessed, when they're the, the rolled oats or the steel cut oats or the um, quick oats uh, or the brown rice, that especially if you're active, a little bit of these foods is going to be okay. Um, it's, the, it's the fact that most of the time these whole grains are heavily processed and manufactured, and these are what we have to avoid. So let's talk a little bit about wheat now. So there's nothing more American than wheat. And this picture of uh, kind of amber waves of grain is something that we all were taught when we were growing up as being one of the most American things and, and in the plain states. Um, where most of the wheat comes from. This was the heartland of America, and this really said what it meant to be an American. Now, the truth is, I always, when I was a kid, kind of imagined to walk through a, a, a wheat um, uh, farm 
the wheat would be kind of like right up there, up to your, up to eye level, maybe a little bit lower, that this was a very tall plant. And once upon a time, it was. However, with genetic engineering and with farmers learning better ways to increase the yield of their crop, what they figured out is when the plant is really tall and you increase the yield or grow more wheat um, and more carbohydrate, then it tends to tip over. And when it tips over, it starts to lay on the ground and it gets eaten by bugs. So over time, they genetically engineered the wheat to be much shorter. And you can see this significant decline in the height of a wheat plant over the last few decades in order to allow farmers to increase the yield and without um, it being destroyed while it's in the field or eaten by bugs. So this whole change that's happened really reflects the fact that the wheat that's out there now is so dramatically different than the wheat that we, we ate 30 years ago. And in fact, than the wheat that we, get, we can get in most other countries. So what's different about it? Well, first of all, it's completely and totally genetic, genetically engineered for, to make it more profitable and less expensive. And what's happened is that there's been a significant change in the type of carbohydrate as they've made that change. So it's not just the height of the plant, but actually what's in the wheat, the type of carbohydrate that's out there has changed dramatically. Now, there's two different groups of carbohydrate. There's actually several others, but the ones that I wanna talk about are um, amylose, which is this straight chained, and amylopectin, which is a branch chain carbohydrate. And what a carbohydrate is, is a ton of sugar molecules, just like you find in table sugar. Table sugar is actually two sugar molecules stuck to each other. Carbohydrate is hundreds, if not thousands, of carbohydrate molecules stuck to each other. And they can be, um, uh, they can be uh, linked up in two different orientations. They can be a straight chain, or they can be branched with all these branches coming off of them. And our body has these enzymes. We can't absorb wheat or large carbohydrate molecules on our own. Instead, we have enzymes. And what the enzymes do is they, they bind themselves to the carbohydrate molecule, and they're like little Pac-Men. And they just chomp off each sugar molecule and release it so that we can then absorb just the sugar molecule and metabolize it that way. Now, these enzymes only work from the ends of the molecule. The enzymes that we have can't insert themselves into the middle of the molecule. So if we have a 200 carbohydrate um, chain of amylose, the straight chain one, we have only two locations that that enzyme can bind to it. And so it's gonna, bind, gonna relieve, um, uh, break the bonds very slowly because there's only two places, only two enzymes can attach to it at once. When we look at amylopectin, we find all of these ends because it's branched. So we have literally, and amylopectin molecules tend to be a little bit bigger, they can be 500 plus carbohydrate molecules, or sugar molecules long. What we find is have a, a, there may be 100 ends to this carbohydrate molecule, so 100 enzymes can swarm on this thing all at once and break it down very rapidly. And we see much higher levels of amylopectin in our wheat today than we did in amylose. Of note, as we're gonna talk about next month, um, one of the foods that's really high in amylose, beans. So most wheat now has more amylopectin than amylose in it, and because of that, it's much more rapidly um, broken down. Also, there's other things like the thickness of the wheat germ or the amount of fiber that's in it that's been, uh, because it makes it easier to process, that's also been genetically engineered. So we're dealing with a very different product. But as important as the carbohydrate content, there's the other components of wheat. So there's a huge amount of talk about gluten. Gluten is a protein that's found in wheat. So wheat actually has protein. Um, and gluten is probably the most dominant protein that's out there. Now, gluten has changed a lot as well. And what, what through the genetic engineering, and whether it was intentional or not, um, it's hard to say, but gluten now has properties of what we call exorphins.
Now, most of us have heard of endorphins. Endorphins are like if you go on a long run um, and your muscles start hurting, then your body, your brain and body starts to release endorphins, which are really very similar to like over to prescription painkillers and heroin. They're opiates um, or something similar that bind to these centers in our brain and they relieve the pain and help us keep going. And this was really useful when we were being chased by a lion and you don't want to be stopping because your leg is starting to hurt a little bit. Your body releases endorphins so that you can push through the pain and get going. So exorphins are different. They're not released from inside. There's something that we get from outside. So what happens is gluten is broken down and it, be, and it releases these exorphins which stimulate the pleasure centers of our brain. So this, just like sugar can do this, wheat can also do it. The gluten can trigger us to be happy and feel full. And this, this is something I've noticed when I eat wheat um, is that it, it, um, it makes it so difficult to stop eating. It just triggers you to eat more and more and more. Um, when I was, I traveled in Italy probably about 10 or 15 years ago and I had pasta there and I couldn't believe how little of it I could eat at one time. Where normally I could, you can eat one or two large bowls of pasta at a time. And I, this was before I really adopted my nutritional program and changed uh, my way of eating. But it, I, I, before I could eat large bowls of pasta without any difficulty, I was much younger too. It was a lot easier to maintain your weight back then. But when I went to Italy, what I found was that small amounts of the wheat, of small amounts of the pasta, would fill me up significantly. And, and this was, I think, a really important, um, this is an important thing for you to understand is that the, the wheat that we're seeing in other countries, the ancient wheat, the wheat that was that in its original state doesn't have the same um, uh, pleasure center stimulating effect. Another thing is something called gliadins, which also work in the same way. They stimulate your appetite. So there's two things. We're triggering pleasure centers and we're stimulating our appetite as we're eating wheat and you're going to eat to the point where you've eaten almost as much as you possibly can. So what happens is, is that this starts to break down the components of our metabolic thermostat. So our, one of the key components is that when you gain a few pounds that your body is going to decrease its hunger and you're going to naturally eat less and as a result will start to drift your weight back down to our set point. So when you're eating foods like wheat that that take over our hunger and start to trigger us to feel hungry for reasons other than our body fat stores and where we are on our, th our metabolic thermostat. Um, when you're eating because you're being stimulated to eat by gliadins and by exorphins, it breaks this whole thing and we start to gain weight slowly over time. So question I get often is sprouted wheat. What's, what about sprouted wheat? Is that okay? And the truth is, it's probably, of all the bread that's out there, the best option. Um, and it typically is organic. Um, this is Ezekiel bread, which is the most common form of, of sprouted uh, uh, bread. And it, in addition to wheat, it has a lot of other things, and it comes from a recipe that exists in the Bible in Ezekiel 4.9. Um, so anyway, uh, Ezekiel bread is probably your best bread option, but should still be limited as much as possible. Um, there's still, you're still at risk for having some of that, that stimulation of your appetite from the gluten and from the gliadins. So I think it, if you're going to eat bread, this is far and away your best option, but it's best if you can avoid it completely. So how do you limit bread? Um, the simplest and most straightforward way to limit bread is to replace it with greens. And this is a picture of what I call a hamburger salad. So normally a hamburger has a bun and then lettuce and tomato and you can put mustard and ketchup on it uh, and then obviously the, the burger. So this you can take some um, organic, 100% uh, or all uh, um, organic without antibiotics, without hormones or anything like that. Take the beef, make up a patty, chop it up and then you put the lettuce in and the tomatoes in and you can grill some onions and you can grill some mushrooms and you can really um, soup up your burger and put pretty much everything on it. I put pickles on mine as well. And then you can use ketchup or mustard, whatever you'd normally put on your burger as a salad dressing. You mix it all up and it really tastes like you're eating a burger. And you replace the bread with the greens and you turn the, the sandwich into a salad. And we've got a bunch of recipes that you can use that'll help you do that. 
So now let's kind of touch base about colorless starchy vegetables. The truth is most colorless starchy vegetables are probably reasonable options. Um, the one that kind of um, requires a little bit of attention is popcorn. Um, and the, the reason it requires so much attention is because popcorn is, is most, uh, most of us will eat popcorn as like a microwave or a skinny pop or some form of really doctored up popcorn. If you're gonna get the, the popcorn and you're gonna use the air, the air popper and eat it just plain without any um, uh, butter or oil or anything like that on it, you can put a little bit of salt, I don't think that's a problem, then that's, that's a reasonable option. That's something I think you can do without too much concern. Um, but the, the truth is most of us eat popcorn um, in a fairly processed state, like the movie theater, of course, is the most common place we'll eat it. Uh, and that's something that we really have to avoid. Other foods like corn, white potatoes, turnips, um, daikon radish, parsnips, jicama, these are they're colorful starchy vegetables. They're great choices. White potatoes are the ones that sometimes require a little bit of, of um, discussion. The smaller ones where there's more skin to um, the, the inside um, of, in terms of the ratio, those are probably a better option. Um, they've now got purple potatoes, which I think are probably pretty reasonable. Um, it really comes down to, with, when we're looking at colorless starchy vegetables, they're probably not that bad. Um, it's about the butter, the oil, or the grease. That's why popcorn generally fails. Um, but if you're going to eat plain corn or colorless uh, or, or uh, white potatoes um, without any butter in a kind of a baked form um, or roasted form, I think that's very, very reasonable um, and, and something that you can incorporate in your diet to some degree. So when it comes down to this, we're going to break these down. The bad, we're going to break down into what I call the not so bad and the pretty bad. So the not so bad would be brown rice. Again, it's not something that, that most people are going to overeat. It's actually incredibly filling. It's a whole grain. It's unprocessed. I, I wouldn't be eating it um, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But if you, every now and then you want to have a, uh, have a little bit of brown rice, I don't think that's a big deal. And I don't think that's going to compromise your weight um, loss goals. Corn as well, as long as it's not um, um, covered in butter, is going to be a very reasonable thing for you to add to your diet. Oats as well, as long as it's the steel cut, the uh, rolled oats, or the quick oats, but not the instant oats. Um, quinoa, again, as long as it's the whole quinoa, the unprocessed, not the quinoa puffs. Uh, and finally, white potatoes, as long as there is a baked potato, not as French fries or, or heavily uh, oiled roasted potatoes. These are all foods I think you can eat with some, with, um, with, within reason. I wouldn't make them the mainstay of your diet, but in terms of uh, being able to add these safely into your diet and consume them regularly, I think that's pretty reasonable. Again, we have to keep in mind what our real goal is. Our real goal is to avoid these ugly foods, these white, the white bread, the white pasta, the white rice, and the instant oats got to get that out of our diet. And if it takes eating a little bit of these not so bad foods in order to do it, then let that be how it goes. So the pretty bad, these are the foods I'd be real careful with, would be popcorn and then whole grain breads. And whole grain breads are, are they're made with wheat. And the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, probably 95% of the whole grain breads that we're seeing at the grocery store are are really so much closer to white bread than we actually realize. And, and in general, our goal really should be to try to eliminate this. So the, the wheat is something I, I think we have to work to get it out of our diet as much as possible, even in the whole grain version um, to, to eliminate. There's so many other better options with the colorless starchy vegetables and the colorful starchy vegetables and some of the other whole grains like we talked about, like um, brown rice and oats. So again, our goal is really to get the wheat out of our diet and to get the, the white rice, the white pasta, um, the white bread, and of the instant oats out as well. That's really our mission here. So now that we've concluded that, we're going to move on to month five and talk about animal protein and beans.